Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the latest of the uh, uh, dairy strategic dairy farm uh, meetings from AHDB. And uh, this one is based on uh, Buscott Wick Farm, and uh, uh, I'll uh, invite uh, invite Heaven and uh, uh, the others to uh, to join me in a minute. But if I can just go through uh, the housekeeping, so. Uh, Everyone is on mute, and so please don't try to unmute yourself <coughs> during the webinar. And uh, all questions uh, will be anonymous during the webinar. So if you uh, look on the screen, it's uh, showing you where you can type in a question. Uh, we would much appreciate this to be a two-way street with regards to uh, engagement. So as we go through, uh, we'll be reviewing the questions, and I'll be trying to drop them in. I'm Nick Parsons, uh, Head of Dairy Development for HDB, and I'll be overseeing the webinar today. Along with me, I have uh, Heaven Richards uh, from uh, Rumination and uh, Phil Kinch, and also uh, Shane McGee, uh, who uh, is um, uh, Phil's, Phil's herd manager. So he's unfortunately uh, uh, having a bit of trouble, but if uh, the other guys could give a wave, and uh, it will relax me into feeling that we are uh, we are underway. Thanks very much. Okay, so uh, the other thing I just need to cover off is uh, Dairy Pro points. And uh, if you uh, do uh, attract or uh, collect Dairy Pro points, then please put in uh, type in your membership number, uh, farm name, address, and postcode, and date of birth in the chat function uh, where we just talked about the, the uh, questions then we can award your account uh, with those. So I'm going to give you, um, there is a bit of an update uh, from the uh, Strategic Farms and the KPI Express tool, and then a bit of an update from Buscott Wick. And uh, following that, we will then go into the uh, uh, maximizing the uh, returns from your, uh, uh, from your growing heifers. So, I will just give a quick, uh, quick overview of the strategic farm. So, as you know, part of the uh, farm excellence platform, uh, we've been developing strategic dairy farms for over three years now, and we've got 17 of those now, uh, now in place. Uh, we continue to uh, develop them, and, and we've got uh, a further six to launch, of which uh, a number are coming up over the next couple of months. Uh, they've all had to be virtual launches, and the idea, the premise originally and uh, up to uh, up to COVID has been these are very much two-way farmer-to-farmer meetings uh, out on the farm, sharing best practice, sharing experience, and so forth, and uh, moving moving through peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning. Now, clearly, with COVID, we've had to move on to a virtual uh, virtual platform, uh, but I hope with uh, today. That one, you will pick up ideas and uh, ideas from heaven as as the specialist, but also have the chance to uh, talk with Phil and uh, Shane about their farm and their experience, and give two-way feedback uh, with regards to updating what the farm's doing, as well as uh, uh, as well as sharing your ideas with uh, with the farm. So, if you can move to the next slide, please, Jamie. Thank you. So each of the strategic farms, each of the 17 farms have got a web page on HDB. So we're trying to share what they're trying to do, why reasons to follow those. And I know, uh, I hope we've got uh, Robin from Scotland uh, today. And uh, this is something that uh, is a benefit of, of virtual meetings, is that people from across the, uh, uh, across the uh, country and across the globe with, with the number of people who have uh, tuned in from overseas as well today, that um, uh, we have the opportunity to share uh, what the farm is doing. So go to the web pages, have a look at each of the farms, find one which suits your system and what you're trying to do. And hopefully that can then uh, help a, a conversation grow with regard to the individual farms that we've got. Thank you. So within that website, we also have the optimal dairy systems. Now, this is a big part of what we've been trying to do with the uh, strategic dairy farms is encourage people to compare farm to farm. 
So each of our strategic farms would uh, measure through their key performance indicators, so measuring, benchmarking, and we at HDB, along with a number of consultants, set up a, uh, a system two or three years ago to try and concentrate either with block carving, KPIs, key performance indicators, or all year round, giving you nine different uh, KPIs to be able to measure yourself against, but also against industry targets. So if you could move the slide, what we now have made even easier and I would encourage you to have a look at is the KPI Express tool. So that will speed up the comparison of, of KPIs. You uh, can uh, look at different, uh, different options with regards to how many of those KPIs you want to look at. Uh, the, uh, it gives you a easy follow guide to, uh, to, to go through the system, but also uh, be able to uh, compare one of those KPIs with uh, with your own performance versus uh, targets or then compare using the website using uh, using a farm that you've chosen out of the strategic dairy farms to also compare how they're doing so it's a step on that benchmarking journey and an opportunity to uh, uh, to start measuring yourself and comparing your kpis so that's the uh, that's the screen that you would see where you sit against excellent performance, good performance, above average or below average. And you can then, uh, the box in the middle gives you the opportunity to find out how to improve your performance by going to HDB led information and uh, uh, opportunities to, uh, uh, to drive forward your performance and, uh, and productivity. Thank you. So I would urge you to go to the website and have a look at that. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is uh, ask Jamie to play the video and then we'll have a bit of an update uh, from Shane with regards to uh, where we are at Buscot at the moment. Hi, I'm Philip Kinch. We farm at Buscot Wick Farm in Oxfordshire and we've got a, a talented uh, Oxford University farm here with a dairy. So we've got a, an autumn block carving herd here. Uh, we're on gravel, so uh, summers, especially like this, the grass can dry up very quickly. So uh, autumn block works well for us. We've crossbred over the last 15 years, and in that we've we've got Swedish red, Norwegian red, Danish red, fleck bees, brown Swiss bit of Jersey that they've gone now um, and a Montbelliard or two. We've targeted so 7,500 to 8,000 litres as our, as our target production. The farm here is 770 acres of which probably 500 is committed to the dairy. Uh, we've, we've got a grazing platform that's in a ring fence here and then outlying grazing for young stock and dry cows on river meadows. So we've got a lot of low grade, uh, unimprovable pasture that we need to try and make value from. Um, and then some reasonable paddocks uh, through, the, through the middle of a farm that we can graze efficiently. When the cows carve in, they come straight in at calving onto a winter ration. We've, we've always brought our cows in at calving to try and get them stable and bulling quickly. We're on then a, uh, a grass and maize silage ration with crimped maize, rape meal and maize distillers in the, in the mix with the concentrates. Their butter fat would be about 4.2, protein 3.6 and then through the winter we will then plan to try and turn out in end of February, beginning of March. Uh, and make the most of the, the spring as best we can. So we're in, the, we're in the calf shed. We've got the first couple of uh, 2020 calves here. They're all looking uh, bright and happy. Uh, lovely to see the, the beginning of the, this year's set already getting going. Uh, we've got another five out in the field that have calved this morning, ready to come in. And uh, plenty more cows out there look like they're about to, about to burst as well. great thank you for playing that now, hopefully if shane is uh, unmuted 
uh, Shane can just give us, uh, Shane's the uh, herd manager at uh, Buscot Wick uh, on behalf of uh, Bill Kinch. Uh, Shane, if I could ask you just to give us a bit of an update uh, around uh, how the farm's running at the moment, please. Okay, I'm not hearing Shane. Bill, I don't know whether... Hi, can you hear me? Ah, yes, we can now. Thank you. Yeah, Good. apologies for that. My, my internet seems it's cutting out a little bit, so apologies if I uh, drop out or anything. Um, go I'll just it. go Thank through... You. I'll just go through um, just the current milking numbers at the moment. Um, at the moment today, we're milking 345 cows, um, 260 are fresh. Of those 260, 175 are cows and 85 are heifers, first calf heifers. Um, then also, we're still milking 85 uh, spring calved cows and sort of cows that are on the cull list, but are still milking well enough to, to stay for the moment. Um, production wise, we are totaling about 9,200 litres a day at 4.1 butter fat and 3.4 protein. Um, the whole, which means the whole herd average is 26.7 litres. The fresh cow average is around 29.2 litres. Break that down a little bit more. The heifers are doing roughly 24 litres and the cows are doing 32 litres, that's the highs. Um, we milk recorded on Friday morning, so I still haven't got the, the latest figures back, um, but that's roughly what it is, so it's pretty good. Um, so the cows that we've calved, is two, we've, two, we've calved 260 cows so far. Um, so yeah, 175 cows calved, 85 heifers calved. We have... 130 heifer calves on the ground um, that will be our replacements going forward and that's all we're going to get I think so the rest are Angus crosses uh, Hereford crosses and and yeah bulls we have we have used a lot of sex semen um, so the majority of our replacement heifers are from sex semen um, we have about 20 cows left to calve and they'll they'll be finished in the next two weeks, I would say. Um, we have 150 heifers to AI. Um, we start AI in, in three weeks. Um, as far as calving, it went very well. I was very happy with it. We had some issues with milk fever. Um, we're still having issues with milk fever, but the cows are bouncing back very well. They're, they're up and running. They're milking very well uh, from the get-go. So um, very happy. And as Phil said in his video, yeah, as soon as they calve, they're in. Um, and they're on a high-performance ration, get them settled, and hopefully no trouble when we start ai -ing in three weeks. So, yeah, that's, that's good it. That sounds like it. Uh, sounds like it's gone uh, gone very well, and you're holding that uh, holding that um, uh, calving pattern very tight, which is uh, which is certainly one of those KPIs that we uh, we look at. Thanks, Shane. Appreciate that. And uh, Bill will will call upon uh, call upon you and uh, Shane as we get questions in. Hopefully that we can have a bit of interaction uh, interaction that. But as we are, uh, I uh, I will pass over now to uh, Heaven Richards. And rumination to uh, uh, be able to uh, present the main part of the uh, main part of the program today. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you can see a slide. Yeah, we can. Okay. Right. So, um, oh, sorry. 
the uh, the theme today is maximising return from growing heifers, and uh, looking specifically here at Duskett Wick at the autumn block carving herd. However, a number of the the areas where we're going to discuss would be equally applicable to all year round carving herds. Um, I think one of the key things with the block carving herd is that there is there is no room to to get it wrong. Uh, it's critical that animals do carve in at two or slightly below. Um, whereas in, a, in an all year round carving herd, there might be uh, a, a view that there's a, a, another chance. But I think you know it's a good discipline to have, uh, and therefore most I think of what we're going to talk about is every bit as applicable to an all year round carving herd as a block carving herd. So when we look at um, the, the issues around heifer rearing and the economics, well, uh, Dr. Alana Bolton's work, um, the RVC back in 2015-16, uh, where they surveyed uh, at, at 101 farms looking at uh, the economics of heifer rearing on a range of systems, some block carving herds, predominantly all year round, uh, but then also looked at the, the, the payback, the time to payback from when those animals carved in. And uh, you know there's very very significant range here, from uh, sort of the the first lactations and, and some herds the payback was within lactation one, the vast majority it was well into lactation two, and in some herds um, it was in lactation three, four, and even beyond at the extreme. So either way, if we look at this, the mean was about one and a half lactations. So when we bring a heifer in, we've got we've got to make sure that she hits the ground running and every bit as importantly stays in the herd in order to to pay back that total rearing cost. So the mean time here was was 530 days, um, and you know one and a half lactations on before we've got to pay back on the rearing cost. So there's two aspects there. One obviously is the cost of rearing, uh, factoring in all costs, opportunity costs, overhead costs, and obviously variable costs. And then secondly, the productivity of those animals post carving. So when we talk about heifer rearing efficiency, well, what kind of things are we looking at? So I think age at first carving is a fairly easy metric um, that a lot of people have now got their heads around. Um, we tend to talk about averages, which can be dangerous. Um, but again, you know, an average gives us a starting point. But then we also need to look at the the percentage that fall within a target acceptable range. So we may have a 24 month average, but we may have um, some animals that we're carving very young uh, in order to 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 make up for animals which are slipping through uh, and therefore carving much later. So we could be we could be running between. 20, 21 months and 27 months, uh, and we have an average of, of 24. So it's a bit like when people look at carving interval, um, the, the the range can, can tell us a lot more than the actual average, but average gives us a starting point, and then we should definitely be looking at how tight the range is around that. Obviously, in a block carving herd, the priority is to get animals carving not only in the block, but really at the start of the block. Um, it's, it's good to be able to start off with heifers, particularly when we're, we're using sex semen and breeding heifers from heifers. So again, that sort of not only looks after this season, but it also ensures that the, uh, the crop of calves that we'll be carving in two years time have, have, have hit the ground at the start of the block. And obviously, you know, we want to allow if there is any slippage in fertility in subsequent lactations, that animals remain in the block. So where we're trying to maintain a nice tight block, then it's absolutely imperative that animals recarve within that block or they inevitably are culled prematurely. So carving at the start of the block is a key requirement for the heifer rearing enterprise in terms of efficiency. Mortality in culling along the way, so looking at losses in forced culls, very often these are down to reproduction. Um, and certainly losses would often be at the calf stage. So again, I think this is a key efficiency to look at in all systems is how many heifers that are born actually make it into that first lactation uh, and then beyond. And then we look at reproductive performance. So again, in a block calving herd, this is really critical because when we when we hit that day uh, where we want to get animals in calf, it's it's really imperative that we get a good lot in calf in that first three week window. So, you know, heat detection, preparation, 
service technique, consistency of diet, all of these things will play a part. Uh, but again, in a block carving head, the stakes are even higher than they would be in an all-year round carving. So submission rates need to be high and conception rates need to be managed uh, through good techniques and good nutrition and management pre and post service. Target weight at service and at carving. So this is a real uh, efficiency factor that I think we've really got to get our heads around as well. Uh, reducing age at first carving has been quite a big, um, a big push in recent years and people have often achieved this. Um, in some ways, it's relatively easy to achieve. Uh, the danger is that we can sometimes then compromise um, the, the, the performance of those animals because we've, we've gone in and carved them younger because that's the, the aim and the KPI that we're aiming for, but we've compromised on, on live waste at first carving, which will have an impact on production and uh, potentially survivability as well. So I think it's very important that we when we're, we're coming back to, to carving younger and certainly in a block situation, carving at around 24 months, it's very, very important that we make sure that we're hitting target weights right the way through the process so that we're hitting that target at service and carving an animal in uh, as we need it to be. Cost obviously comes in, so cost from calf to carving varies tremendously. Uh, generally, block carving herds, the costs are somewhat lower. A uh, number of reasons potentially for this. One, I think possibly because we're, we're rearing calves and heifers within uh, tightly uh, aged groups, which, which means that we can target nutrition and management more closely rather than in an all year round calving herd, particularly uh, a, a sort of a more moderate sized all year round calving herd where there tends to be a big spread of ages at every stage. So block calving herds do seem to have uh, a, a benefit there uh, and but they vary tremendously between farms and depending on uh, largely performance but also mortality uh, and also the actual cost of managing feeding uh, housing and, and and handling those animals from calf to calving so cost is is definitely worth scrutinizing but uh, achieving targets is probably the most important thing uh, in order to get the overall picture and then finally, milking herd performance and survivability into lactation two plus. So again, we tend to look at heifer rearing efficiency uh, and the beginning would be when that calf is born and the end would be when it enters the milking herd. But in reality, um, if we do that, we may actually be missing a trick because if we have um, compromised milking herd performance and survivability, then we really are missing a trick and certainly uh, economically that is not good news. So I think in order to really assess the heifer rearing program, we do need to look at how those animals go on and perform and how, how, how they go on and, and survive within the herd because there will be other aspects that will determine how they do. But um, what we don't want to do is to, is to do one thing on the heifer rearing to improve so-called efficiency, but compromise the actual performance and survivability of the milking animal. So the key stages, and I think it's important with this kind of process to break down into key stages and look at them individually. So the newborn to weaning, so things like colostrum intake, so, so important, absolutely critical in terms of not only performance, but health and sort of survivability. Then looking at the milk or calf milk replacer, the, qu the quality of the product fed and the quantity being fed. Is that really fit for purpose? So scrutinize what you're doing in relation to uh, what you're achieving. Daily live weight gain, that is the gold standard measure. If we can weigh, we can then assess, are we achieving what we need to achieve? If we're not, we can then break it down, look at what may be compromising um, the performance and hopefully take steps to put that right. Weaning weight, that gives us a really good indication of how effective the calf rearing regime is and, and then determines what sort of animal we've got to go from there on. If we've got good performance at calves, in my experience, it's quite easy to continue that. And we have animals that have got thrift and will continue to perform at a high level. If we've got compromised performance pre-weaning, very often then, we, we struggle with performance on individual animals or with groups from there on. 
Health is critical at this stage. And again, a lot of, a lot of the health issues come back to colostrum intake and, and management in those first few hours and days. Respiratory health is a challenge. And certainly I think in autumn calving herds, that's probably one of the bigger challenges because we have a lot of calves born in a relatively short window heading into the autumn. Uh, and, and more variable weather. So respiratory health is certainly one to be aware of. And I think particularly with, with block orcs and calving herds, because we are sort of kind of going against nature in having a big block of calves born heading into winter. Evan, uh, we've just uh, had our first question in. So uh, I would appreciate uh, anybody else got any questions, both for Shane and, and Phil with regard to the farm or, or Evan with the presentation. Uh, but uh, the first question comes in with regards to how do we know uh, calf milk replacer uh, is fit for purpose? So what, what are the measures? What, what should we be looking out for with regards to uh, uh, measuring, that, uh, measuring that quality? Well, I think it's, it's a matter about using, looking for, for a product which has got some, some, some support and some data behind it. So we're looking for a high level of dairy protein. The young animal will utilize dairy protein more efficiently than, than, than any plant-based protein. So we don't want to see high levels of plant-based proteins. Um, but we essentially, I think we need, we need to look at a product that we can work with that's got support, it's got evidence behind it with clear guidelines in terms of uh, feeding programs. And then ultimately on individual farms, you know, the measure is in performance. So, there are a multitude of products out there where people are achieving uh, good, bad and indifferent results. So I think it's in some ways a matter of finding a product that works within your system. But really, it's about looking at good quality dairy based protein um, with products which are consistent and reliable and, and are supported by the suppliers who will stand by the performance of their product. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. So the next key stage is weaning through to pre-breeding. So um, this is quite a critical stage, certainly getting them through weaning. It's a fairly major change nutritionally. Uh, we tend to have group changes. We have other things going on, vaccinations, disbudding, et cetera, all happen within a relatively short window. So a smooth transition through weaning, uh, again, is, is the aim. So maintaining starter intake, trying to maintain that daily live weight gain as close to close as possible to where it was pre-weaning. Um, very often there's a tendency to try and move on to perhaps cheaper feeds, in my view perhaps too quickly, rather than just, just really focus on this smooth transition. Uh, get rumen development. We want uh, an animal to develop its rumen so that it can utilize forage effectively. Um, again, it can be a mistake to be introducing and relying too much on forage too soon because the rumen development isn't really there. Um, and in many ways, it's better to get that rumor development and then really capitalize on the animal's ability to utilize forage from there on. So gradual changes, weaning to pre-breeding, maintain that daily live weight gain on a diet increasingly based on forage. Uh, the reliance on forage will depend on forage quality. So again, um, you know, we tend to think, oh, well, that's heifer silage there. It's not good enough for milking cows. It's second grade. Okay, it may be, it may be suitable for heifer, but it may also need balancing up and, and supplementing in order to achieve the daily live weight gain that we need. So again, forage analysis is the starting point. It gives us an indication of whether that forage is going to deliver what we need it to, uh, and enables us to balance the diet around it. But secondly, measuring, weighing. Assessing daily live weight gain will validate the, the, the ration performance. So if we're not achieving daily live weight gains, we need to adjust feeding and not wait until it's too late to try and pull it back. Dry matter intake is important. So things like feed space, feed hygiene, availability, comfort of eating, you know, as animals, you know, when we're dealing with growing heifers, they are growing, so they're getting bigger. So what may be adequate room when they move into a pen uh, you know, months, two months later, they're significantly bigger animals. So suddenly there's more pressure on feed space, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Concentrate use. So again, 
targeting that around the forage quality uh, and, and feeding something which is suitable. So if we've got a low protein forage, then it's it's not good economic sense to use a low protein concentrate. A higher protein concentrate may be more expensive, but equally it may allow us to feed less of it um, because it will be a better balance for the forage there. So there's a tendency to perhaps to, to, to go for cheaper options when it comes to heifer feeding. But if we're looking to really get this performance, with animals that are converting feed very efficiently, young animals are efficient converters of feed into into tissue. So that's something that we need to bear in mind uh, and, and try and provide a diet which is suitable uh, and will achieve the sort of the target of 0 0.8, 0 0.9 kilo a day at this critical time. Obviously, in a block carving herd, uh, grazing uh, is is an opportunity. There are two good grazing opportunities, and this is one area where cost comes down in a in a in autumn block carving herd calf rearing is done over winter the young animals are housed over winter they're then grazed through the first summer housed put back in calf and then um and then obviously graze in the second season so there are two two opportunities to get a significant amount of grazing in there but again where we're looking at a target-led approach with consistent daily live weight gains grazing management has to come into play as well. So there's a tendency with young stock to sort of put them in a paddock and forget about them. Uh, again, we need to just assess, is that achieving what we need to achieve? Are we compromising growth rates by not managing grazing well enough? Do we need to supplement perhaps some of the younger, smaller animals? Do we need to group? Do we need to just monitor what's happening uh, season to season? Because weather conditions, grass availability will have a huge bearing on what level of growth we get through that grazing season and obviously with a block carving herd at the end of that grazing season we're fast approaching the point of service so any any deviation from target in the grazing season can be catastrophic in terms of service weight just before you move on sorry having uh, questions are coming in now um a question on uh, elaborating on the dry matter intake, if we can, uh, just uh, uh, whether we can just stretch that out a bit to uh, to understand a little more about the target for calves, and also yeah. level of protein um, level of protein target for those those coming off uh, uh, weaning. Um, yeah. If we could. Thank you. Um, in, in terms of protein level in concentrate, there's there's always quite a bit of debate. Um, I mean, in the states, for example, they they, they tend to feed significantly higher levels of protein than, than, than we generally would um, and I think in reality what we've got to do is to strike a balance between providing enough good quality protein to promote uh, lean tissue growth but at the same time bear in mind the cost of additional protein and the marginal gain if any of overfeeding protein and of course we've got to consider the environmental impact of that as well so generally uh, in terms of protein content of a, of a sort of a rearer fed alongside straw, I would tend to be, be aiming for about 20% protein with you know, a range of protein sources. If we then move on to a sort of a TMR as they do at Buscombe Wick, uh, generally sort of 16, 16 and a half percent total protein uh, in the diet with, with about 10.3 to 10.5 ME it seems to work well. Um, herds I'm working with, we, we, we seem to get the, the daily live weight gain, the lean growth, the frame growth rather than uh, over condition. So protein is important, particularly where we've got low protein forages. So more mature grass silages or whole crop or maize, for example, if they're used, they must be used with care. Starchy concentrates can uh, over supply energy and, and lead to excessive body condition, um, but at the same time, not promote the frame growth we need. So protein quality can be reduced as the animal gets older, uh, as the rumen becomes more developed and, and sort of protein is effectively upgraded within the rumen but the younger animal uh, higher quality protein is beneficial uh, and then we can move more to rely on the forage based protein uh, and, and, and other products such as rape meal um, as they grow older so forage quality is the starting point as with the milking cow diet we look at the forage quality build a diet around that we need to have the same mindset with with rearing diets as well thank you and just touch on the dry matter intakes. Um, Sorry, calves, yeah. Would we be looking at chopped straw? Would we be looking what would what would be your your favourite? Mm, 
at the calf stage, there, there, there seems to be a, a benefit from incorporating some chopped straw in, in with the starter. That seems to stimulate intake. Um, what we're looking for with straw really is not to, to have a high intake of straw, but to have just, just a, a very moderate intake of some fibre, which will then just, just sit there and develop the rumen alongside the concentrate. Um, Intakes from there on, we would generally be looking probably two and a half to three percent of body weight. So again, as the animals grow on, it's important to, to keep them on a, on a truly ad lib diet. Problem is, if we don't do that, we'll we'll tend to find variation between the more dominant and the the more um, submissive animals within the group. So uh, you know, if, if feed is running out, and unless we've got really adequate feed space for all animals to eat at once, then um, we do need to ensure that they are truly ad lib. Otherwise, the smaller animals will tend to, to not be able to meet their requirement and the larger animals will, will over consume. So yeah, in, 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 in essence, with these younger growing animals, uh, it's important to keep feed in front of them so that they can all have a chance to, to meet their intake requirement. That's really useful. Thank you. So coming back to the rearing costs, I touched earlier on on where the sort of the numbers were sitting in the the Bolton et al. survey from 2015. So you can see the herds that were were, were surveyed. 73 were all year round, um, and you know the, the rearing cost there was higher than the the, the block calving herds and the multi block. So we were looking at sort of 1,900 for the average of the all year round, whereas the autumn block was down nearer 1500 so quite a significant saving largely i believe because the block calving herds would tend to be um probably dare i say better managed than the average all year round it's not saying that there are some very very well managed uh, heifer rearing operations on all year round herds however there would tend to be perhaps a little bit more leniency in terms of age of calving um block calving herds are block calving because they have chosen to be. They haven't just gravitated into block calving herds. So there's a very clear uh, definition and a very clear sort of target approach. So uh, it'd be very much age at calving will be very tightly managed, obviously, because they're calving in a block. And like I say, there are other economic gains as well in terms of the, the, the sort of the scale of the number of animals coming through as a group, and obviously the opportunity then to graze effectively over two seasons as well. So the good news here from the block carving herd system is that you know, there is scope to reduce heifer rearing costs, but it, equally, if you're an all year round carving herd, you need to scrutinize heifer rearing costs and look at how you can get down to these sort of numbers because it clearly can be done. The other significant thing that came came out of that particular survey was the impact of age at first calving so again block calving herds by default calving 24 months um, really do fall into that sort of 1500 band rather than herds where age at first calving drifted right up so we can see you know at the extremes the herd with heifers coming in at 3000 pound a head with uh, you know an age at first calving around three years so pretty much a straight line very good correlation there between age at first calving and the cost of heifers so if you're concerned about the cost of heifers on your farm the first thing to look at is what age they carve at then how you can pull that back because that's probably the first and single biggest impact you will have on cost. The other one then, they looked at the time spent at grass. So again, this ties in well with the block halving herds uh, in that they do have quite defined grazing seasons. And again, that has a significant uh, linear uh, effect on heifer rearing costs. So another advantage there for the block carvers, but again, something which all year round carvers can do better um, by by trying to work with groups of, of sort of closely managed animals which can then be grazed um, you know in a controlled manner um, more difficult obviously where calves are born perhaps midsummer, where then obviously the calf rearing phases is in the grazing season they then end up with effectively two winters rather than two summers but uh, there will obviously be a proportion of animals born in the in the autumn and the spring where grazing can be a significant uh, cost saving opportunity so the importance of weighing well why and when well i think 
why it's to identify strengths and weaknesses within within any within a system so when i when i've looked at heifer rearing systems on a number of farms and we do break it down and we look at performance at different stages and the key stages we mentioned earlier invariably uh, there are stages in the process that are being done very very well and inevitably there are other stages which are being done not so well so weighing does give us that opportunity of identifying the weaknesses in the system and therefore effectively getting the biggest bang for our buck by changing the things that need changing and not worrying about the bits that we're already good at so if if we're already achieving really good performance up until weaning well we just need to carry on doing what we've been doing because it, it's working really well if we're seeing a significant weaning check and we're losing daily live weight gain significantly from weaning through say to six months well if we can address that we'll we'll have a major win uh, and, and really pull performance back into line equally if the grazing season is letting us down we can then look at how we we can improve that is it down to grazing management is it down to perhaps pushing it a little bit too hard on the shoulders and losing some performance uh, right on the either, either end of the grazing season? Or is it because we're, we're, we've got some animals that just struggle to compete? So weighing does give us that indication of which parts and which parts of the process of heifer rearing are working on our farm and which ones need further attention. Obviously, we're looking at average and the range of daily live weight gain. So again, this gives us the average gives us an idea as to whether the system is, is is predominantly on track but the range will also then identify animals that need perhaps managing a little bit differently so the weight of the animal at a particular stage and its daily live weight gain up to then can really help determine what should happen to that animal in the next stage of the process so essentially it gives data to aid decision making we might be making group or subgroup management decisions. So it might be that the whole group needs some additional feed because live weight gains on average are below target. Or equally, the, the, the average may be on target, but there are a subgroup of animals that are struggling. So it might be then the most cost effective and the most effective thing to do is to actually create a subgroup and then manage those 15, 20, 25% of the of the whole group slightly differently put some supplementary feed into those give them improved grazing or even just house them separately as a smaller group to give them a better chance to compete we have performance and cost decisions so the other the other point with weighing is that if we are actually ahead of target then we've got the opportunity to reduce cost so we might have a situation where we feel we're actually exceeding daily live weight gain targets because we're overfeeding um, forage quality might be actually higher than we first thought forage analysis gives us an indication but if the forage is consistently outperforming the expectation then we've we've we're aware of that and we can may may make cost saving decisions in terms of supplementary feed so weighing does give us a lot of useful data and it helps make sure that we follow this curve in order to carve animals in at the right weight at the right age so when should we weigh well weighing at birth is relatively easy and it gives us a, a good indication and, and, and a starting point for that individual animal weaning and again possibly six weeks post weaning so weaning gives us uh, the indication of how effective the the calf rearing phase has been six weeks or so post weaning tells us how good we are at managing that weaning process so are we weaning abruptly are we weaning, weaning gradually we're, we're generally combining calves into bigger groups how are they coping with that are we making feed changes that sort of six weeks post weaning really tries to break that down and, and, and gives us a, a measure of what's happening there. Turnout, well, again, that's going to tell us what's happened from weaning through till, till the, they go to grass and gives us a, a barometer of the, the winter feeding regime. Uh, the ones I've put in brackets here are probably the sort of the gold standard. So again, in many cases, we might weigh at turnout and again at housing. Personally, I think a mid-season uh, weighing is, is valuable, particularly in a block autumn calving herd where we do need to just know that we are still on track. So if we've lost performance from, say, 
April through till July. It's quite good to know where we are in July rather than find out in October when we want to start serving in November. So that mid-season will give us an idea of how grazing is going on that particular year on that particular farm. So housing is generally relatively close to the breeding phase and then it may be combined with the pre-breeding weight. So, so those two could well be combined. We've got the animal in calf. So again, we're going to weigh at turnout, possibly mid-season, and then at calving, because that tells us whether we've achieved our target or not. So there are a number of key points there where I think if we weigh at those points, we can then assess how we're performing are we delivering the best performance when we need to? Are we in a situation where if we improved uh, performance at grazing, we could make further savings on, on feed costs when the animals are housed? These are all things which may come to light once you've got some data and, and some information to work with. So I'll hand over to Shane now, who will just talk us through the sort of calf and heifer feeding regime at Buscatwick. Shane with us. Yeah, I know Shane's been having trouble with his internet. Apologies, apologies. I was, there he is. I didn't. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Apologies. Um, so the cow calves um, and the calf is picked up within a 24 hour period, especially when we're busy. So we only pick up our calves um, once a day, which means we rely on the calf sucking colostrum pretty heavily we do we have been trying myself and adrian the calf rear have been really trying this year to um to tube colostrum as much as we can so we've tried to get at least two liters of high quality colostrum into our replacement heifers definitely we have been favoring tubing our replacement heifers if if our bull calves and our um beef calves don't get tubed we we sort of let that buy a little bit especially when we're quite busy um, which is not ideal because you're relying on the calf to to navigate um, teeth seal, half is trying to kick them, getting mixed up with other calves, etc. Um, but it is something that we're we're very aware of, and we're going to try and um, definitely improve next year. Um, after that, they are in groups of seven or eight, depending on how many cows calf within within the day. Um, and they are fed on multi teed feeders for also depending, but up to possibly five days. But realistically, we'll try and get them onto the automatic calf machine as quickly as we can, just just for management. Um, so it is possible that a calf that's two days old will be tried on the calf machine. And they have been very good at latching on. Um, if if we have trouble with them, we will bring them back and put them back on the multi feeders again. But generally, they have they've jumped on pretty well. Um, so once they're on the on the calf machine, they're fed a very high quality milk replacer. Um, they're fed at yeah 125 grams per liter, and they'll get to a maximum of nine liters a day, and are weaned slowly weaned um, at about yeah eight and a half nine weeks. The machine is pre-programmed, so it does all that for us. Um, we set it all up. We don't have to. The only the only real um, monitoring we do is that if the calf at the beginning, if the calf is drinking its fill as it goes along, um, once it's up and running, we haven't had too much trouble with with calves going backwards, not drinking, getting sick. We, we it has been quite a good um, a good run as far as that goes. <clears throat> um, Following off from that, they they are, have access to chop straw and high quality cake um, from day one, basically. Oh, sorry, from day one in the in the calf machine pen. Um, 
And then as they get older and they get closer to weaning, we are introducing um, a bit of dairy TMR. Um, so after that, they're moved on to a dairy TMR exclusively with um, two kilos of start, calf starter cake. And then as time goes on, the cake is pulled away and the TMR is increased. Um, we try and get them out, out as quickly as we can, but realistically, it's um, it's mid to late spring. Um, and they're kept as one group, if we can, depending on grazing, depending on grass availability, depending on the weather. Um, then throughout the summer, they'll be monitored and also depending on availability, they will probably be split. We, we did split them this year. Um, we had 150, we have 150 replacements this year. So we split them. We took 40 of the smaller, younger ones and put them in a different block. Um, and they've done very well. Um, everything is housed weather permitting early mid late october um to get them used to the tmr pre mating um start serving 10th of november roughly um the plan for the heifers is uh one one service of sex semen and then another service of conventional semen and then the bulls will go in. PD in end of January, beginning of February. And hopefully we go again, turn out mid to late spring, depending on weather conditions and availability of grass. Um, and they usually, they usually stay as one group, just for management ease, until they are they start springing and then they are uh, put in with the transition cows. They're not kept separate, they're, they all go in together um, two to three weeks before they calve and go on a full transition diet with the cows and they calve in the same area, in the same place as the cows. Um, that's pretty much it then. That's, that's really useful. Thank you, uh, Shane, for that. And while you're on, uh, just to uh, just give Heaven uh, a little bit of a break, I've got a couple of questions that have come in. So uh, just wanted to, you just answered one, which was, uh, do you do anything with the different with the carving heifers? And I think you just really touched on that they uh, they follow the uh, the cows cows routine. Um, but the uh, second one, uh, with regards to milk fever, you mentioned earlier on, um, you'd had challenges. Uh, other, uh, the the person's highlighting that other autumn block uh, carving herds have, have had problems this year as well. Uh, did you get to the bottom of the cause? And uh, another question that's come in with, with regards to what had you done with regards to trying to uh, try to deal with the with the uh, uh, with the milk fever itself? Uh, we, we, we haven't got to the bottom of the cause, which is really frustrating. Um, we've tried a few different things. We've had um, uh, minerals analyzed. We've we've tried different magnesium supplements. Um, we've tried different levels of limestone flour. Uh, we've tried a few things. Um, I think what we're doing at the moment, just for the just for the end to get through it, is um, stick to the stick to what we've been doing. Even though it hasn't quite worked, we're still going to stick to it, um, and then just be really vigilant. We have been really vigilant the whole way through, and we haven't had any serious downer cows any cows that have gone down they've, they've bounced back up very well um as soon as we get to them and we're just we just have our, our eyes in the back of our head for any cow that looks a bit wobbly and she just gets um calcium under the skin or any any suspect cows that we're thinking yeah she looks like a candidate she will just get a bottle of calcium under the skin no questions um and that's that's basically how we're trying to stave it stave it off so that's useful thank you Right, we'll come back to uh, some more questions Can later. I just jump in on that. Yeah, go for it. Um, so I, I think one of the things which affected autumn blocks more this year with milk fever is uh, we we 
carve everything outside and that's that's one of the challenges or one of the things we, we wanted to do with the autumn book is to try and carve outside but it relies on those cows loafing on effectively barren grass fields which normally in a an average if there's such a thing average english summer our fields would not have a, a lot of grass on them at that time of year um, whereas this this year they um they they they, they grew they grew particularly well and so there was there was a lot more grazing for them to keep chewing over although it wasn't ever significant i do wonder how much of an impact that had on ours and on other all year round uh, sorry autumn block carving situations the other the other thing which was interesting this time in the past when we would have had less milk fevers they tended to be very severe um, whereas this time, although we had more than we've had previously, and I, I, I wasn't happy with the numbers, the severity was relatively light. They 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 were they were caught very quickly and they bounced back um, very well. So um, it it was it was frustrating, but it was it was all credit to Shane's team. They dealt with it incredibly well. Yeah, thanks, Phil. That's uh, that's useful and that kind of tags on and, and uh, uh, supports and, and feathers out a bit further. Uh, Shane's Shane's view as well. We've got more questions coming in, but I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to hand back to uh, Kevin to uh, carry on. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, uh, and I think Phil probably hit the nail upon the head there. I was going to just add in very quickly on that milk fever. Uh, I think what we what we had was quite a strange season in terms of grass growth, with with very limited grass growth early on, and then some rain, which meant that we got a flush of grass um, and and an uptake of potassium. Which uh, so even even in a situation with dry cows, where they wouldn't appear to have an abundance of grass, obviously what they are doing is grazing it as it grows, uh, and with the luxury uptake of potash, then. It's a, it's a very very fine line, and and that I suspect is probably the root of the problem this time. Whereas you say you'd normally expect sort of July August to have some pretty dry bare pastures, whereas we had that in sort of April and May, and then uh, a, a lot more grass later in the season, even in the drier parts of the country. So just um, coming back to to the sort of the overall heifer rearing appraisal. Um, I visited the farm a few weeks ago, got some data and then started to dig and to look at perhaps uh, try and break it down in, in some ways that haven't been done before. So obviously we're here now, we're at the end of the 2020 carving block, but it's, it's probably too early to, to make any real judgments on those. So I went back to the 2019 group and just looked at what happened there. So um, these were split into month of carving. So August 19, September and October, obviously uh, very heavily weighted in terms of August, the beginning of the block. So 57 animals carved in August, 28 in September and 12 in October. So I think we can say the 12 in October are effectively outliers. They're, they're there because they, they gravitated to that point as opposed to being there because anybody wanted to carve uh, 12 heifers in October. So essentially the August carving were right at the beginning of the block. September were animals which sort of drifted on uh, into the latter part of the block and the October were the outliers. So uh, looking at the age of carving, uh, quite understandably the August ones were 23 and a half months. So the September just over 24 months. So, you know, literally three weeks older. And then the October uh, 25 months, so uh, a sort of a one and a half month or six week uh, range in average age, depending, uh, ranging from the August to the October carvers. Um, 305 day milk yield was taken from the CIS recording, the herd records monthly with CIS. And in, in, in many situations, the 305 day milk yield is perhaps a little bit of an old fashioned and, and not particularly relevant metric um, where lactation length varies. But I think in a block carving situation, it is it, it is quite a relevant figure because essentially that lactation at 305 days is to all intents and purposes over and done with. Because in in if things have gone to plan, the animal will be going dry and preparing to carve back in again. So looked at milk yield on 305 days uh, of the August and the September and the October carvers. 
interestingly, the August calving animals average 6,929 litres. The September calvers averaged some 500 litres more at 7,458. The October calvers had gone back down and were down at 6,784. So what we've got here was actually quite a significant milk yield improvement between the August calving heifers and the September calving heifers. So we'll park the October ones for now, but I'm curious really, um, and, and sort of having spoke to Phil uh, and, and Shane about it the other day, just to try and identify areas why that may be. So the other aspect that we then wanted to look at was, was how many were culled or were barren. So there might be a tendency to think, well, the higher producing heifers in a block calving herd uh, may be working too hard and therefore might struggle to get back in calf and survivability would be affected. But certainly in terms of this 2019 crop of heifers, uh, the opposite seems to be true. So in reality, of the 57 uh, August calving heifers, there was a pretty serious uh, amount of wastage in terms of culls and barrens, i.e. animals which haven't calved back in a second time. So 15 animals uh, didn't make it through, which was 26.3% of the August calving heifers. Admittedly, it's a small sample and, and we're, we're literally talking about half the number of heifers calving in September, but uh, according to the CIS records, only two of those have not been in a position to recarve, i.e. culled or not recalved. So 3.6%. Interestingly, the older heifers, so that we don't get carried away that this is an age thing and therefore the older the heifers, the better they go on. When we get into the October ones, uh, the, the, the average loss bounces back up, albeit on a smaller sample, to 25%. But I think the, the really interesting and, and slightly concerning figure for me here was um, A, the August calving heifers produced less milk, which is an important factor to consider, particularly in an autumn block calving herd, where you know that early lactation milk is generally at the highest milk price of the season. Uh, the farm supplies Arla, uh, and Arla obviously uh, in line with many processes are paying a better autumn price than the spring price. So therefore the value of that autumn milk and that early lactation milk in the block calving herd is significant. So we've got, not only have we got less milk, but very concerningly, we, we appear to have got poorer survivability on those early calving heifers. So they're, they're literally only just over two, two weeks younger. So we wouldn't think that that sort of two weeks of age should be making such a big difference. So then are we looking at things like uh, how they've transitioned in? Obviously with the block calving herd, we've got a lot of animals targeted to carve at the beginning of the block, hopefully both heifers and cows. And maybe areas around transition need looking at because something is compromising these early carved heifers. So overall, we're looking at about a sort of a 25% sort of slippage from first from first calving through into second lactation, which is certainly higher than we would want. Coming back to that first slide in terms of when do heifers pay back, generally uh, we're looking at at least halfway through the second lactation. Well, if 25% haven't even come into the second lactation, it puts quite a burden of cost on the ones that do. So that I think is something for Phil and the team to really dig into and look at and just try and identify what's going on um, with this sort of uh, early part of the calving season in terms of heifers. Maybe that 2019 was, was, was a bit of an anomaly. Uh, it'd be interesting to do the same exercise in the 2020 crop, but obviously they'll need to get through a lactation before, before we can do that. Uh, historically then, decided to look back went back to the sort of 2016 and the numbers were pretty consistent really so 75 percent of the heifers that calved in 2016 uh, were milking in their second lactation the following December I I took the view that if they were milking if they weren't milking by December they had effectively left the herd or were calving out of the block uh, 2017 was slightly better at 72 percent 18 76 and 19 uh, at best, we'd say 79, because it'll all depend on uh, whether any 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 
of those animals have any issues around calving or haven't yet calved in. So we are looking at you know more heifers not making it into second lactation than we'd really want, uh, and that is a significant cost, and it's one that we do need to really consider in terms of the heifer rearing efficiency. So looking at the performance uh, and, and what was going on there, um, so the two the two graphs here. I'm sorry, the, the the sort of the scale on the axis isn't isn't really clear to you, I'm sure. But basically, on the uh, on the left hand side, we're looking at milk yield, kilos a day, and then days in milk. So days from calving, we've got the lower line uh, here, if you can see the mouse, which is the the sort of the the, the predicted lactation curve for the August calving heifers, and then the same on the lower graph for the September calving heifers. So what was quite clear was that the August calving heifers, as we expect with heifers, had a very, very flat lactation, but generally sat at around 25 litres. They're really sitting in between that 20 litre and the 30 litre bracket, very much through until uh, this sort of 200 days. So here we're looking at about 200 days. Um, so we're looking at 30 day blocks. So the August calving heifers really just sat there at about 25 litres as an average. The September calving heifers were generally sitting at about 28 litres. They dropped off a little bit there, uh, 150 days plus. Bear in mind that they would be obviously a little bit further on uh, having calved a month later. But they would. it would appear there that certainly through 150 days, they maintained about a three litre per head per day gain. So that was quite significant, and it sort of showed that 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 difference that we we saw at the end of 305 days uh, was was not really just a, a a blip. It was a very consistent thing that was seen through the winter. Bear in mind, all these animals are fed TMR. There's no individual parlor feeding, so there's no question that any animals had any preferential feeding. It would just be a matter of what they were able to eat and and where their performance came in. So again, as I said earlier, averages can be misleading. So this one looks a little bit noisy, but essentially what we've got here, every dot is an individual individual animal uh, and, and every sort of block is a recording. So this tells us at any milk recording through the year, however many days in milk that animal was at, what was its milk yield? So the August animals, what we are seeing here are a significant number of animals in this sub 20 litre bracket, which is definitely not where we want them to be. So this sort of 25 litre average is being produced from a significant number of animals that are in the 28 litre and above consistently through to 200 days and beyond, but a worrying number of animals down here. And this to me often does point its way to issues around transition competition and dry matter intake in, in early lactation. If we come to the September heifers, yes, we're looking at a better average as we did on the last line, but what's really notable is that the best heifers are not really doing any better than the August heifers. The best are in line with the best in both months. What we've got in September though is far fewer, uh, and in reality, very few, certainly up to 150 days that are sitting below 20 litres. So the reason why the September heifers are outperforming the August heifers on average is not because the best are outperforming the best, it's because the August have not got this bottom quartile that are really dragging the average down. So like I say, these animals here that are sitting sub 20 litres uh, would suggest that there's something distinctly happened to really put the brakes on them early on and they've never really got going. So I think that really is an area worth investigating on farm um, to identify A, where the loss of production was, but B, were these then animals which failed to rebreed and, and effectively became coals prematurely. So September performance, really, really respectable nice and consistent uh, and and you know good survivability as well august beginning of the block maybe a little bit too much pressure and a compromise in performance so coming back to weighing um key weight targets which i feel are relevant to the system at busket wick birth weight 
we'll throw in a nominal 38%. We talk about targets of doubling weight by weaning. So I think that should be a minimum target. I think if we can exceed double, that is even better. And I think if anything, I would prefer to aim for two and a half times birth weight. So it'd be nice to get these animals up to about 100 kilos at weaning in the majority. They won't all get there, but if it, I, I think that, that the target should be a minimum of doubling birth weight by weaning. And, and possibly if animals are not doing that, then weaning could be delayed a little further in order to get, give them that little bit more chance. With turnout sort of expected to be around April from the mean calving age, we would want to get from 100 kilos up to 220 kilos by turnout. So that will give us a good, well-grown heifer to go out to grass, an animal that should be fairly robust in terms of grazing. So it's going to stand a few wet, miserable days and, and should be in a position to graze aggressively and achieve good grass intake. So live weight gain targets there up to weaning of about 0.9 on average, and then continuing certainly above 0 0.8, 0 0.85 from weaning through till turnout. Achieving that is 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 really down to a smooth transition off milk through weaning, good nutrition, good housing, and good health through that first winter. From turnout to housing, well, if we can achieve 0.75 as an average, that will give us a 370 kilo heifer at housing. Uh, in the case of Busket Wit. Uh, service is relatively soon after housing, so the numbers aren't significantly different there. And we'd be looking to try and maintain that sort of 0 0.75 to 0 0.85 through that winter on the heifer TMR, really focusing on growth to have a 500 plus kilo animal at turnout and hopefully a 600 kilo animal at calving. So as a percentage of mature body weight, 12 months, which would be around here, we're looking to, to be 50% of mature weight as a minimum, um, and then 90% of mature weight at the point of calving. So those are sort of some key indicators really based on what happens on this particular farm in terms of when they're born, when they're housed, when they're turned out, etc. So what I, if we... Uh, sorry. Sorry, apologies. Uh, can I just jump in? I've got a couple of questions. It may be relevant to uh, you being able to answer them, uh, Heaven. If not, yeah. Shane, maybe uh, you'll be uh, able to come back. But um, the grazing management, uh, grazing management on the farm, is it set stock to or strip graze? So, sorry, next slide again, please. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, what's the grazing management? Are you set stocked or strip grazed um, cell, uh, cells, or how do you how do you work? Yeah, for, for a young stock, it's set stock. Yep, right, marvellous. That's a great, concise answer, knowing that we've got a bit, uh, we're up against time. Um, what's the main reason on the farm for culling heifers? Is it fertility or other? Yeah, fertility would be the main one, yeah. Right, so not getting the backing calf. Uh, yeah. Right, okay. Uh, much appreciated. And um, I, I have got a bigger question. I think I'm going to leave that to the end and let, uh, thank you, Shane, for coming in. Uh, I'm going to let Heaven press on uh, for approximately another five, five, max ten yeah. minutes. So we've got yeah, some time for questions at the end. That would be yeah. brilliant. So what if we we fail, even if we only marginally fail to hit targets, what does it actually mean by the time we get to the point of carving? So just to break the numbers down to get from 38 kilos to 600 kilos in 24 months, we need a relatively modest 0.77 kilo live weight gain every day. So it's not a, a sort of too much of a mountain decline. However, um, we can quite easily slip away from that, certainly at, at certain times, if we're not aware of what's going on. So even if we get a 50 gram a day shortfall, which is absolutely minuscule across all stages, I we just fail to, to reach those targets every step along the way. And, and the early life uh, experience will, will certainly uh, make that a more likely outcome than if we get a really good start. Well, what we end up with then is instead of a 600 kilo heifer, we've got a 560 kilo heifer. If we get 150 gram a day shortfall in live weight gain across the two grazing seasons, so again, you know, grass management, grazing quality, availability, weather conditions, i.e. limited grass or wet weather and, and, and low grass intakes, uh, 
you know, that's 300 days potential grazing. Uh, so again, we're down to a 550, 560 kilo heifer just through these shortfalls in, in the grazing season. I don't know if we get a 5% yield penalty because of that 10% lower live weight, that could be 350 litres, even at 28p. And in an awesome situation, we'd hope that 28p is, 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 is very much on the low side. But even that equates to £98 a heifer. So even if we have to make some investment in additional feed or management time uh, in terms of rotational grazing or grouping, in order to get these heifers on target, we don't need a particularly big lift in performance to give us a significant return um, on, on, on that heifer's investment. Going back to that earlier slide as well, remember, the animals that, that had the lower production uh, also had the poorer survivability. So the real cost comes in if we have this 550 kilo heifer that then struggles to compete in the herd, doesn't rebreed uh, it, it within the target window and ends up being cold. If she ends up in one of that 25% that doesn't make it into lactation too, uh, really the, the, the minor savings we've made in the rearing are completely outweighed by the cost of having to replace that heifer with another heifer after one lactation. In a block situation, we've got that risk of slippage of early calving heifers into mid and late block. And then any further slippage in later lactations means inevitably colic. So the heifer rearing and the performance of heifers and heifers being on target at calving is a really key uh, performance indicator for a block calving herd. Because if you get this slippage, we're immediately into a culling situation. And that is not good news economically or from a production point of view within the herd. So some general area opportunities for improvement across uh, herds in general. Well, sex semen on heifers, as we heard earlier, Phil and, uh, and Shane talking about, you know, it, it, it really is a no brainer in my view. Uh, it means that we can really front load the number of heifer calves born early in the block. So if we've got heifer calves born right at the beginning of the block, we've, we've, we've actually got animals that we're then going to carve at 24 months and not animals that we're trying to carve at 22 and a half months. So if we can increase the percentage of heifers born early by using sex semen on heifers and possibly even the earliest cows to be bred, then we, we really do make life easier in terms of rearing the next crop of heifers. I think early life, daily live weight gain, a uh, huge area for, uh, for improvement on many farms. I think the thing that really hits home is the impact that this early life, daily life weight gain has on lifetime performance is, is it has to be seen to be believed. But if we can get a really good start, you know, so health, nutrition, environment, yes, there may be a higher cost per day, but we've got high feed conversion efficiency and lifetime gains. If we're rearing a beef animal, we've got a finite job. It's going to get to the age of slaughter with a dairy heifer. By the time it reaches calving, the journey is only really just beginning. So these lifetime gains really do give the payback in terms of optimizing early life performance. So it's not just about spending money, it's about colostrum management, good quality calf milk replacer or milk, good intakes, good quality starter, quality protein, health, hygiene, etc., etc. Post-weaning transition is another area of weakness maintain this quality starter intake, always be looking for this point eight of a kilo a day plus. Grouping, I think it's a really good opportunity to, to even up the groups of heifers as never you can. So if you're weighing, use that as an opportunity to regroup uh, according to size and performance, because it's incredible how the poorer performance will catch up if they're given the opportunity, perhaps in a, in a lower stocking density group, uh, with animals that are more evenly matched to their size. If you're feeding a TMR, well, look at the protein supply, look at the energy sources. We need to be careful if we're feeding starch. Uh, minerals and vitamins are important. Look at the overall cost. Sometimes we can take a convenient option, for example, using the milking TMR. It may not be the cheapest option, and in reality, it may not always be the best option nutritionally for those heifers. We may actually just overdo the body condition at the expense of frame growth. Weigh and adjust feeding and management at all key stages. And this is really where we can sort of put our finger on the dial and just wind it up a couple of notches or wind it down. Weighing gives us the confidence to do that uh, alongside measuring. 
So some specific recommendations that I would make following a, a brief visit to the farm and a look through some data uh, and a chat with Phil and, and Shane. Um, I would urge them to invest in suitable weighing and recording software to identify areas to improve performance or reduce cost. I think the scale of the operation and how critical it is that we, we, we hit these targets, I think you know, an investment in weighing and, and, and weight recording software would really show a return uh, and, and really help you know, improve the management and the efficiency of not only the heifer rearing, but uh, the milking herd performance as well. Uh, it's a real challenge when you're carving a large number of cows, but review costs and protocols. Again, I think relying on suckling is probably a little bit um, bit of a risk to take, particularly in that early season where we've got a lot of heifers carving down with heifer calves and bearing in mind how critical colostrum intake is. So I think it might be worth, again, reviewing that, possibly getting some bloods done to just assess where the starting point is, you know, what's colostrum status like on your current regime uh, and then come up with a plan from there on. Um, we had a discussion uh, which certainly needs to involve the vet in terms of pneumonia, bovine respiratory disease in general. And again, I think this is something perhaps worth looking at and investigating by looking backwards at animals that have perhaps failed to perform uh, in the milking herd, failed to rebreed or didn't grow particularly well. And just look, is there any link there between uh, individual cases of respiratory disease in the rearing phase as well? There are herds where they've carried out that sort of investigation that it gives them a very clear indicator indicator of uh, the impact of respiratory disease on later performance. So I think this is something worth looking at. And then, you know, again, with the vet coming up with a strategy to manage that, be it vaccination or alterations to housing and grouping, et cetera. Review the suitability of the milking TMR. It's a high starch maize-based diet, crimp maize. So a really sort of high performance milking cow diet, but I would be perhaps a little bit concerned, certainly towards the second part of the winter, uh, having young heifers on this ad lib. Yes, it's convenient. It's one mix and it's, I assume, fed out as part of a milking cow mix, but I would perhaps just check it against performance and cost. Group based on live weight and daily live weight gain, identify and support poorer performance in order to pull them back into line uh, and, and, and ensure that the maximum number of these heifers hit target. Grazing, I think, uh, again, set stocking, it's worth looking at a little bit, uh, look, looking at this in a little bit more detail. Getting some daily live weight gain figures will, will give a good indication of what the current grazing regime achieves. Does it achieve what we need it to achieve? It, it may well be for 60, 70% of the heifers, it's perfectly adequate. It might be that the easiest thing to do then is to actually manage the smaller, perhaps later born, 30% slightly differently uh, in order to pull them into line. Post-breeding, again, target higher daily live weight gain for late season born, early season calving heifers. So it's quite feasible. We get a heifer calf born at the end of the block and she grows on, she reaches the beginning of the service period and then conceives to a first service. That animal is going to have, potentially have a short a short lifespan before before first calving. So uh, it's important perhaps to look at those animals to ensure that they do reach target weight for calving and don't then get penalized for effectively doing what we want them to do, i.e. conceiving to an early service uh, and, and, and holding that pregnancy through. I think transition and fresh cow nutrition is very important. Uh, again, as these heifers carve in, big numbers carving in in August, certainly talking to Phil and Shane, it does put pressure on the system, it becomes a bit of a bottleneck and the risk is that the heifers are the ones that really do get squeezed the most. The, the, the physically bigger dominant cows, and again, this is a, a, a very sort of mixed herd in terms of genetics, where we've heard, you know, there are, there are animals, Fleck V, Montbelliard, some pretty strong, robust animals, but also some other sort of smaller breeds, Scandinavian breeds, etc. So there'll be quite a bit of variation in cow size, uh, and obviously dominant cows will generally uh, beat uh, first lactation heifers in that critical transition time. And I think what we were seeing there in terms of milk production and survivability of the August heifers, um, I would be looking hard at 
transition in terms of space, facilities and nutrition as well. So that wraps up my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Like I say, it was a brief visit to the farm. These are difficult times and uh, it was a matter really of having a good look and a chat with the guys as we walked around, getting some data and hopefully pulling some areas that will merit some further investigation uh, for Phil and Shane and the team, but obviously also hopefully for the rest of you to have some food for thought to take away as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And I think we've got uh, a few questions that we can uh, pose if, if people want to come back on camera, if you've got the chance. Um, Phil, I know Shane, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to, but hopefully if you can all come off mute, then uh, I can just pose a few of the questions to you. And um, I think uh, that's been really a, a really good run through. I think I picked out a, a few points that uh, I'll just sum up with at the end but uh, we've got a couple of minutes and I don't particularly want to run over too far but if we can keep answers short but are there any financial advantages uh, Heaven, uh, to getting the weights of these heifers higher above target weights through the uh, through the seasons? Um, I'm not sure that there are any that there are any significant advantages to being above target I think again what we're really looking to do is to try and bring as many animals up to target as possible and using that rearing phase to take out as much variation so we've got a six week sort of spread of birth weight potentially uh, we've got obviously that varying performance in, in 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 early life but if we can take every step of the rearing process and, and end up like a funnel if you like so that what we produce at the other end are heifers that are predominantly on target carving in at 90 percent of mature weight the difficulty again in a crossbred herd is is defining what the, the the mature weight should be or is so that does make it a little bit more challenging but i know talking to the guys the plan going forward is to perhaps um standardize the genetics a little bit more in order to, to get a bit more consistency in but i think if we can pull the bottom up um it's it's going to have a much bigger win than than taking the top uh forward again that's useful thank you and hopefully that answers the uh answers the query um does the milk yield compromise as a result of being under target weight uh, carrying over into subsequent lactations? I'm not sure if you looked at this for bus stop, but what would your what would your view be? And I don't know, Phil, if you uh, have got any uh, view with regard to these these heifers that haven't met targets uh, yield wise in in first lactation, whether whether subsequent lactations are all also back. Um, I haven't looked at it specifically because, let's say, we just looked at that one crop. Um, I think you know there there would be some evidence to show that there there is you know a, a certain carryover into subsequent lactations, but I think ultimately in this case it's about trying to identify what's limiting those animals that are that are significantly below because what the two graphs showed us was that we haven't got um, a sort of a complete block running below. What we've got is is a, is a huge amount more variation in the August ones, which to me suggests a proportion of animals struggling. Uh, around calving and then more importantly perhaps than the milk yield for those potentially uh, that's tying in with this poor survivability and uh, and transition into lactation too but like I say it's, I think it's one for them to perhaps look at it may be that last year was a slight anomaly but I think the four years worth of data would suggest that not enough heifers are calving back in second time around and I think it's worth drilling down and seeing what's going on Right, thank you for that. And uh, final one, I think, regarding time, um, and it's a bit of a wider question, which is interesting, and I think it would be good to get your view on it. Is uh, how do you think you can overcome challenges with an external heifer rearer? Uh, do you think you can set those targets uh, should be stipulated in the contract? And if so, uh, what as a minimum? Now, I think you did uh, after that question came in. You did give some figures uh, with, within the what if piece, but uh, any views on whether whether targets for external calf rearers should be uh, should be part of the contract? Uh, very, very simply, yes. Um, we could we could have a complete new webinar on on uh, external calf rearing and heifer rearing uh, systems. Uh, personally, I feel that a lot of the arrangements in place are actually uh, sort of rewarding failure to a degree. 
so they're based on, on on a payment over time so in effect delay actually increases the revenue to the rear um, the, the better more professional arrangements have got clear targets in and i think it's important that rearers are rewarded for achieving uh, targets um, first and then penalized for failing to meet targets secondly but i think there is a win-win because for the for the host and the home farm um, the real win is having heifers calving in um, that are strong healthy at the required weight calving at the right time hopefully to sex semen that's the real win uh, if it means paying a little bit more to reward uh, the rear at achieving those targets then i think it's money well spent but it's it to me it's a no-brain to have an arrangement where targets aren't in place because it's, there's too much at stake to lose thank you for that phil i wonder if i could just bring you in with regards to the uh, suggestions that heaven's made and and your feeling generally with regards to uh, what you might be able to do to take this forward uh, well you or, or shay uh, one last comment before we uh, wrap this uh, wrap this up thank you yeah no, i appreciate having this time digging into the, the figures and looking at the performance of the, the heifers the last year or so. I think we'll, Shane and I'll probably spend a little bit more time probably going back a little bit further, um, see whether or not it's something that we've consistently had um, or if it was a one one year. Uh, but we're also looking at the, um, the buying a, a weighing system. Um, obviously, the, the grants, the product of grants have just opened up and ways are on that as a as an option so um so we're just trying to work out which is the best system which one we want to go with um and affordability so i yeah i think all, all of it is is doable um i think I mean, shane's been on a very steep learning curve since joining us um back in the in the spring and it's not been an easy year with 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 all the extra restrictions we've we've been under so um so yeah it, it's it's I, I, i'm delighted with how we've how we've got to where we've got um and it's it's nice to have some proper focuses on, on where we go forward so uh, much appreciated that's great to hear and hopefully some of the feedback and some of the questions today also uh, uh, feed into that discussion as well so i'm gonna have to wrap it up there thank you uh heaven uh shane for your input and uh, and of course phil uh, for uh, for uh, supporting the uh, strategic dairy farm uh, platform as we go forward. Now I've got um, uh, a couple of dates. Um, we've got a launch happening with the Scottish uh, strategic dairy farm. Uh, Wallace and James Hendry. A spring block carving herd is happening on the 28th of October. Um, we've got a dairy quiz, which is slightly. Uh, uh, a drift from where we would usually uh, be working, a slightly more light-hearted, trying to lift the spirits through these COVID times. Uh, that's arranged for the 23rd of October. If you look at the website, you'll be able to find the details and be able to uh, uh, sign up for that. The Knowledge Exchange team are just trying to uh, uh, engage people in a different way, so uh, we'd really appreciate uh, support, uh, support to that. That's uh, on an evening, uh, just to uh, uh, have a have a, have a drink and uh, a bit more of a light-hearted uh, rumble around some of the questions and and uh, around dairy so that's something else that I would uh, encourage that's 23rd of October at 7:30. so I'll wrap up there thank you very much uh, as an audience you've been great with regards to the amount of questions we've had that's made it uh, two-way and engaging uh, I thank again uh, Heaven and uh, Phil and Shane for participating and uh, I'm Nick Parsons, uh, Head of Dairy Development, and uh, been uh, through HDB, and hopefully you've enjoyed the webinar. Please complete the uh, questionnaire at the, uh, that you'll be sent through. That would be really useful for us uh, to uh, continue to try and improve what we're delivering to you as levy payers and uh, as an audience. So uh, we'd appreciate those, uh, those questionnaires back. Uh, it gives us good guidance with regards to where we are. And finally, the questions we haven't managed to get to today, uh, we will send an email out with uh, trying to answer all the uh, all the questions that we've had. So thank you very much, and uh, uh, goodbye.